Well, I uh, thought I'd ask you a question to start with, which is, have you ever had a moment or an experience uh, where perhaps after meeting with someone, after a meal, who knows what, you've suddenly realised you've been perhaps standing next to or talking to someone who was famous, someone that you didn't realise perhaps who they were until after that moment? Have you had that kind of experience? Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen the movie Notting Hill. Uh, The movie Notting Hill is about, it's a romantic comedy, uh, and Hugh Grant is in it, uh, as well as Julia Roberts. And Julia Roberts plays this, you know, superstar, this uh, celebrity, this very famous actress. And uh, Hugh Grant plays uh, kind of this bumbling bookshop owner. And uh, basically they meet up and, you know, they fall in love. Uh, but there's this scene in the movie where Hugh Grant takes Julia Roberts to his you know, weeknight family dinner. And he doesn't tell his family that he's bringing Julia Roberts, this you know, famous actress. Most of the, the family clues on and realises who she is, except for one person. This one guy has no idea, has this conversation with Julia Roberts and asks, oh, you know, what, what do you do? She says, I'm an actress. And he's like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I know actresses aren't really paid that well. And she says, oh, actually, I earn quite well. He's like, oh, good, good for you, good for you. And then after dinner, Julia Roberts goes home. And the moment she leaves the, the house, the house erupts because they're all kind of like being, trying to keep it cool, you know, while they've had this lady there. And he's like, what is it? What, what have I missed? And they, they say, you know, it's Julia Roberts, the world famous actress. And he's like, what? Oh, I asked her how much she earned and (laughs) all this kind of stuff. He's very embarrassed because he didn't realise who it was that was there in the room with him. And uh, it would have changed so much what he would have said if he'd known, wouldn't it? Well, sometimes we can be like this. Sometimes we can be like this man in the room, uh, not knowing who is there with us. It's very easy for us to think of Jesus, or to treat Jesus like someone less than perhaps he is. It's easy to miss who it is that Jesus is, and that can sort of lead to all host of problems in our lives, in the ways that we live. Well, we're returning today to John's Gospel, of course, uh, chapter 6 today. And in case you missed it, last week in chapter 5, here's kind of what we saw. The last two weeks, I should say. In the first week, we saw the sign. Jesus was healing on the Sabbath, and we saw a bit of the explanation. Uh, But in in chapter 5, there is this clear distinction. There's a sign, there's something that Jesus does, which was healing on the Sabbath, and then there's another bit, which is the explanation. Jesus always explains what the sign means. And in chapter 5, the healing on the Sabbath showed that Jesus was equal with God. So that's chapter 5. This week, we head into chapter 6, and over the next three weeks, we're going to be in chapter 6, And it's a similar pattern. Chapter 6 has a sign, a miracle, this time the feeding of the 5,000. And then next week, you'll hear the explanation, what it means, as Jesus explains what this sign means about him and who he is. And then in the third week, the last bit of this chapter, this, by the way, is the longest chapter in John's Gospel, you'll see the reaction, how people react to who Jesus says he is. So that's to give you a framework so you know where you are, so you don't get lost in these three weeks, and so you can remember we're kind of seeing a bit of a whole, right? So keep that in mind, and it'd be great to read the whole chapter and see what you think Jesus is trying to tell you about who he is. Well, we are looking today at the sign, and in fact, there's, there's kind of two signs in this passage you might have noticed as we read. There's a public sign, right? He feeds 5,000, but there's also a private kind of miracle, this walking on the water incident. So we're going to tackle it kind of like that. Uh, We'll spend a a fair bit more time in the first sign looking at the public sign, the feeding of the 5,000, and then we'll send uh, a little tiny bit at the end looking at that private miracle. So let's have a look at the public sign and the one who is the prophet who is to come into the world. Well, in chapter 5, we're in Jerusalem. In chapter 7, we're back in Jerusalem. But here, in chapter 6, Jesus is in Galilee again, in the north of the country. And we're told 
uh, that he crosses across the lake, crosses across this, the Sea of Galilee. So today's miracle is happening over here in the mountains on the east side of the map. That's where Jesus is, and he performs a pretty amazing feat, a feast for 5,000 or more, in fact. So that's where we are today. Well, Jesus has gathered a bit of a crowd, right? Because he's been doing some amazing things so far. He's healed a man on the Sabbath. He's turned water into wine and many more things. So there's a crowd following him. And if you've got your Bible open, and I encourage you, do try and bring your Bible along uh, because we can't hand them out uh, at the moment during COVID. But if you look at verse 2, you'll see there's a large crowd that follows him. And it says, a large crowd was following him because they saw the sign that he was doing on the sick. They're following Jesus because he's a healer. They've seen him heal people. Maybe they needed healing, or maybe they just wanted to watch some incredible things. But this is why they're watching and following Jesus, whether there's something more, whether they really comprehend who he is, we don't quite know yet. But in verse 3, we see that Jesus was there initially, at least, just with his disciples. He was on a retreat kind of thing. He'd gone away with just them, hoping, I think, probably to teach them privately. And lo and behold, uh, his quietness is disturbed. We read in verse 5, Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? The private teaching, you know, retreat might be over, but Jesus sees, sees that there's still an opportunity here to teach his disciples something. So he asks Philip, you know, Philip who's a native to the area, who lived in Bethsaida, which was pretty close to the mountains that they're at. He asks them, in essence, how can we feed these people? Philip, how, how can we do it? Now, in case we start to think Jesus is panicking, you know, he, he's, he's like, oh man, so many people, how am I going to do it? We're told in the next verse really what's going on. He said this to test him, that is Philip, for he himself knew what he would do. Jesus isn't in a panic. He's not worried really about how to feed these people. But we're told this is to test Philip. Now it's not a vindictive type of testing, but it's an opportunity that he's giving Philip here to to realise who it is that's asking him the question. Jesus is giving Philip here the opportunity to see that there's only one solution to this problem and you need only understand who it is that's staring you in the face to know the answer. Well, how does Philip do in this pop quiz? What's his answer? Well, we see it, don't we? In the next verse, uh, Philip, he fails dismally. He just sees what's in front of him, doesn't he? Because his answer just displays that he's just thinking of the material. He says something along the lines of, Jesus, you know, if I worked for 200 days, I couldn't pay the money to buy the bread to feed all these people. It's, it's impossible. We don't have the resources, is kind of what Philip's saying. Well, that's what Philip says. We notice Andrew then pipes up, and he might seem a bit more hopeful. He says, you know, here's a guy, a a boy, a young child. It could be a a young child or a youth, but a boy. He has five bread, bread loaves, barley loaves, two fish. Is Andrew putting forward a solution? No, actually, Andrew here is just saying, look how unrealistic your request is. All we've got is five loaves and two fish. It's just not possible to feed that many people. There's nothing here to feed them with. We've only got this. That's kind of what Andrew's saying. So they're both just looking, aren't they, at what's before them, at the material, at the physical. They're not looking at the one who's asking the question, really. Who is it that stands before them? I can remember about 10 years ago, uh, myself and Sarah went to a training conference together uh, and I was considering the possibility of doing what's called a ministry apprenticeship, uh, which is kind of like a traineeship uh, in Christian ministry. Uh, And I was investigating this. 
And as part of this conference, I would meet up with uh, someone and we just, he, he was just there to sort of be a sounding board to talk through kind of what I'm thinking and put forward some options of, you know, what might be possible, where I could be trained, that kind of a thing. Anyway, he asked me at some point during this conversation, Sam, uh, you know, if anyone in the world could train you, who, you know, anyone alive, because obviously you'd go Jesus, but anyone alive, uh, if anyone alive could, could train you, who would it be? Uh, anyway, I kind of wasn't sure about doing this strategy yet and I thought, well, oh, I don't know if I want to really commit. So I'll put forward, you know, an answer that truly, surely is not going to happen. Uh, so I'd been to a conference probably, you know, a few years before that and saw this really good speaker from England. And I thought, oh yeah, that, like, that would be good, but unlikely. So I said, oh, this guy, I, I reckon that would be a great place to be trained, thinking surely not. Lo and behold, he's like, oh, yes, oh, yeah, I know him, yep, yep, oh, I could call him, we could call him right now, actually, and we could see if he's interested in training you, you know, a bit of logistics, but we could work it out. And I was like, oh, too fast, too fast. I didn't really think that this could be possible, but it all depends, doesn't it, on who's standing before you, who it is that's there. Well, as Christians, the Lord Jesus is always with us. But so often as Christians, we just look at the material, the physical, what's in front of us. Instead of looking at Jesus and seeing that what he can do, we search at all the other possible solutions and problems, the roadblocks. That Jesus could actually help is sometimes the last thing that we think of. And we end up becoming Christians with a very small vision of what's possible and what can be done. We become like Philip and like Andrew here, just bringing up the objections, not considering the one who is right there before us. I think if only, if only we as Christians saw more clearly who it was that is with us, we wouldn't be so pessimistic about that impossible scenario. You know, that my friend, who for so long has rejected Jesus, that he, that friend might become a Christian. Or that we as a church might stretch ourselves beyond the comfortable seats of no risk. You know, that we might seek to reach out to our community and push harder than we do. Or perhaps that sin that just seems to, you know, be undefeatable in your life. Perhaps if we had a bigger view of Jesus, we might realise he can defeat that and that it's not impossible to overcome. So let us, brothers and sisters, dream bigger. Let us have a bigger view of who Jesus is that we might not just see all the roadblocks but instead have eyes to see what the Lord Jesus can do. Well, what can he do? Well, we read on, don't we? We see what he does here in the story. He multiplies loaves and fish. And not with party tricks. It's not like some, you know, big smoke build up before and out comes all the bread. Ho, ho, ho. No. What happens? Verse 11. Jesus took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated so also the fish, as much as they wanted. Jesus simply gives thanks. He hands out the food and voila. Suddenly we have enough. It's amazing. And in fact, more than enough. If you read on, when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. The people are filled to the brim, so much so that when there was just five loaves, now there's 12 baskets full of loaves. There's more than there was at the start. So let the disciples and us never decide that nothing can be done. Who is this that stands before them? Who is this that can make Something in abundance, in fact, out of nothing. Who is this man? 
well, we see, don't we, that the crowds realize something pretty incredible has happened here. They realize that this guy is, hmm, <laughs> he's significant. We see that in the next verse. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. The prophet who is to come into the world. What do they mean? How do they get to that conclusion? It's a good question. If you were a Jew at that time, perhaps you might have noticed, and if you read the passage and as we're looking at it, you might notice the time that this happened at. It was the Passover time. And you might notice and remember if you were a Jew at that time that around the Passover time, you remember Jesus, not Jesus, so you remember God bringing you out of Israel, of Egypt. And you remember that God fed your ancestors in the wilderness from heaven. That bread came from heaven as we read in that psalm that recalls that event. You might also notice that this is happening on a mountain. Jesus is on a mountain. Much like in the wilderness, God met with his people on the mountain and Moses went up onto the mountain. You might also notice here that the people are filled to the full, much like how the people in the wilderness were filled to the full with bread and with meat that the Lord gave them to such a degree that they were kind of fed up with eating meat, uh, bread and meat. You might notice all these things and think, wow, this reminds me a lot what Jesus is doing today of what happened many, many years ago to my ancestors and the stories that I've heard of that time. If you wanted to find out a bit more about this, then I'd recommend going and having a read of some of the things in the Old Testament. Exodus 16 is the story of the bread coming from heaven that God gives them. And there's some serious parallels there between what God does there and what Jesus does here. There's also this prophet Elisha in 2 Kings that you go and have a look at and see how he does something very, very similar. It's quite amazing. It's not quite 5,000 people though. But there are again, some very similar phrases there. See, what's happening is that we're meant to see that this man, Jesus, is doing something that's fulfilling what's happened in the Old Testament. He's fulfilling events of the Old Testament and he's fulfilling these people, these sort of prototypes, these people that pointed towards something greater. In Deuteronomy 18, there was the promise of a prophet to come like Moses. So the people at this time are remembering things that Moses did and Jesus is now doing, in fact, greater and more amazing things than Moses. He's doing things that the Lord did. So that's why they're thinking this is the one, this is the prophet who is to come. I hope that this helps you if you've ever wondered to, how do I read the Old Testament? Because this passage shows us that when we read the Old Testament, we're meant to see Jesus. So when you read the Old Testament, have a think. Is this telling me something more about who Jesus is? Are these events pointing me towards the one who is to come? Is there some kind of shadow that I'm looking at here that's fulfilled in the New Testament? It helps us to understand how to read the Bible, and I hope that today it's helped you to understand how to read the Bible some more. Well, that's who they think Jesus is. We see their reaction in 6.15. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. The people's response is to make him king. They see that it's their responsibility to take him and make him their ruler. They want to make him the king that they want and they think it's their responsibility to do that by force. But how does Jesus respond? He withdraws. He goes back up the mountain by himself. He won't be pushed into doing anything or ruled by the will of the people. He's not their kind of king, in fact. He's a different kind of king than they're expecting. And Jesus will fully reveal that when he's ready. But for now, he's not going to be pushed into their mold. Have you... Um, I don't know if you've ever heard the story of Queen Victoria. 
Maybe you've seen The Young Victoria. There's a movie also about her. But Queen Victoria was a, a, a young queen when she became queen. And she had a lot of people trying to push her into a mould of what that queen should do and push on her uh, different suitors that would sort of mould her to who they wanted her to be so that she would do the things that they wanted her to do. So she was very, uh, you know, quite sceptical or, or discerning about who it was that she led into her inner circle because she was worried about these people trying to influence her and trying to push her into this mould. She wasn't going to be someone's puppet queen. I don't know about you, you might also have had some kind of experience like that. Have you ever uh, had it when you have felt forced to do something by someone or, or felt manipulated into serving in a role or you know, manipulated into being in a certain position? It's not a, not a pleasant experience, is it? But it does happen. Sadly, we do manipulate one another. And we, I think, can behave like this ourselves with Jesus when we try to make Jesus who we want him to be rather than who he says he is. We can try and force Jesus to back our views without listening to what he really says or all that he says. We can get upset, can't we, when Jesus doesn't uh, do what we want him to do in our lives. He doesn't answer that prayer request. He doesn't make us wealthy and rich. Or we can completely just ignore things that we don't like about Jesus, pretending that they don't exist, that that isn't actually what he says in the Bible. We can do all this. We can behave like those who want Jesus to fit our mould rather than listening to who he is. So rather than doing that, let's listen to Jesus. Let's hear who he is in his word. Let's come to him humbly, willing to listen, even if it might not be quite what we want. Let him dictate the terms of our relationship and let's listen to each other. God has given us one another. So let's hear one another and hear the wisdom of one another as we try and hear who Jesus is in his word. Ask someone else, what do you think this means? Well, that's the public sign. That is what Jesus has done. And next week, uh, Wayne's going to unpack that even further so you'll be able to understand what this miracle really means about Jesus further. But hopefully you've seen some things in it already. But you might have noticed uh, in that Old Testament reading that we read from Psalm 78, that in the wilderness, the people tested God. God did this amazing thing. And then he was really angry with his people because they didn't believe or trust that he could do it. Is Jesus like that? What happens here? in today's passage, after this miracle. We've seen the disciples, you know, they they questioned and they didn't really get it right. They didn't think Jesus was able to do it. So how will the Lord respond to them? Well, we've seen he's gone up a mountain, he's withdrawn. And then what do we read on? The disciples, they hop in a boat and they start heading back across the sea. We're not sure why. Uh, Maybe Jesus had told them to go earlier. Um, But they're battling a storm when they're out there, we see. One of those snap storms that comes upon the Sea of Galilee. And in the midst of it, Jesus comes walking on the water. A pretty crazy thing. And I think if I saw anyone doing that, I'd be pretty scared. And we see that's their reaction. Not frightened at the storm, but frightened at the one who's walking through it. Jesus, on the waves, walking. Terrified they are. What does Jesus say? He says this. It is I, do not be afraid. It is I, do not be afraid. Jesus has been doing some amazing things beyond explanation and that could be really terrifying. Or you could remember that reaction in the Old Testament, in the Psalm. The people who didn't trust that the Lord could give them the food in the wilderness. And it was a terrifying thing because they'd not trusted the Lord. Thankfully, our Lord Jesus and the Lord God is very patient with his people and he was patient in the wilderness and he's very patient. He doesn't do this to terrify them, but instead he says, do not be afraid. He has great power, but he has not come to terrify us with that. He's come to reveal himself so that we might know him. 
And we notice Jesus' words have immediate effect because before this, he's standing outside on the surf, (laughs) outside the boat, and we read on, they welcome him into the boat and they were glad. Instantly, they turn from fear to gladness and instantly, they're at the shore. Maybe another miracle. Well, who is this man? He's far greater, isn't he, than they could ever imagine and capable of far more than we think he is. And yet, he's not the one that we should fear. If you're his friend, that is and you're his follower. So instead of fearing him because of his greatness, we should see his care and come to him as our friend who is able to help us. It's a great hymn called uh, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And I think it picks up this attitude that we should have towards the Lord. One of the verses is, Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. The Lord Jesus is our friend. We should not fear him, but come to him with our troubles. Well, this is Jesus. The one who makes the impossible possible, who is capable of more than we imagine, who is the fulfillment of the Old Testament and who is not to be just pushed into our moulds. But he's the one who can feed the hungry. He's the one who can walk on the water. He's our friend and he calls us not to fear. And so, like the disciples, we can be glad to take him as our Lord, glad to have a friend in Jesus. May we be glad to know that truth today. Amen.